Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, so when uh, Chief Williams reached out to me and asked me to speak, he said, I'd like you to speak on something to do with special events planning, because that's kind of the area that I have worked in for a while. And uh, I started to think about what could I talk about that was maybe meaningful to the group, but also would benefit me personally and my work group as we prepared for the threats of today. Uh, I want to start by saying I am not an expert in anything, but I am a uh, professional worrier, if you will. Just like many of you, I get paid to worry about the venues and the patrons that come to those venues that are under my charge. So I do that a lot. Uh, in fact, I do that probably way too much. Uh, and today, I am worried about the topic that we're going to discuss because it is not only an emerging threat for all of us, uh, but it's an emerging threat that, it, or it's a threat that's already emerged and is uh, really beginning to, uh, to escalate. We're gonna talk about it. So uh, I'm going to give you a discussion that is really focused from a law enforcement perspective because that's, that's all I know. That's, I'm just a cop. Uh, but I know that we have dis different disciplines in here. And I just hope that uh, after this next 45 minutes that maybe I've given you some things to think about for your own particular venues, your own particular uh, places that you want to safeguard and that you can take some of those and maybe utilize them or give you something to, to spark uh, further discussion uh, at your places. Um, and I, finally, I hope that if we have some discussion at the end of the presentation that I, I will learn something from you because that, that when I do these type of talks, uh, I really, I often learn a lot in the preparation for them and then in the dialogue that occurs either in this public forum after or a lot of times in the back of the room or the hallway after these are over. So, um, you know, basic 101 speech giving is you always start with a story or a joke or a video or something to get the attention of the, the group. I'm not a very good storyteller. This is not a joking matter. So I want to start with a, uh, a video. That hope works, because it didn't work earlier. Play this for you. So, I want to talk about vehicle ramming attacks. What we just saw was a 3D reconstruction of the vehicle ramming attack in Nice, France. That occurred almost a year ago. In fact, we're just a few weeks away from the July 14, 2016 uh, anniversary of that, of that attack. Uh, that attack uh, killed 84 people. It wounded, injured uh, about 450 more. I think it was 437 more people were wounded during that attack. So, that, I wanted to use that one as an illustration because that was a tremendous amount of damage that was caused by one person, one actor, one vehicle who also, he also had a gun. You know, vehicle incursions, vehicle attacks uh, are becoming more prevalent. Sometimes they are utilizing a weapon in addition to the vehicle, and sometimes it's a firearm, sometimes it's an edge threat. So let's talk about it. What's the history of it? And this, again, I'm no expert, but this is, this is the, my research has shown that there have been 45 ramming attacks since 1973 worldwide. About 17 of those have been related, not related to terrorism, and the rest have been related, or ter has a terrorism nexus. And if you look, those at this, at this bullet right here, of the uh, 28 terrorism-related attacks, 17, or 60% of those have occurred since 2014. Think about that. They have over half have occurred in the last two and a half years. Why is that? Why do we have this increase of attacks? I just wanted to kind of list the ones that have occurred since 2014. And believe me, 
I had to keep adding to this list as I was preparing this uh, presentation because we just had the, uh, the uh, London attack uh, just a few weeks ago. Look how many attacks we've had that have been a vehicle assault alone or a vehicle assault combined with an edge weapon attack or a firearms attack that have occurred worldwide in just the last two and a half years. It's astonishing. These are the only the ones that have a terrorism nexus. You know, we had the, we had the man in New York City that was in Times Square uh, that uh, did the vehicle ramming attack that doesn't appear to be that it's gonna have a terrorism nexus. That's another one that, that that's not on this list. So it's just, I wanted to put this list up here to show you just how prevalent this is becoming in our society worldwide. And it's something that we all should worry about. You know, if you, I don't know where you are from or what venues you represent, but it doesn't matter. One of these on this list is the Ohio State attack. The Ohio State attack, and I was uh, just at a conference a couple of weeks ago where I got to listen to the police chief from Ohio State talk about that vehicle ramming attack. Talk about how it uh, emerged, talk about the person that did the attack itself. And I, it really drove home to me that it can happen anywhere at any venue. It doesn't matter. So why? why? Why are these attacks becoming more prominent? Why are they becoming more uh, uh, frequent? Well, really it's this, first of all. Vehicles are easy to access. You know, after 9-11, uh, there were, you know, it was obviously much more difficult for terrorists to hijack a plane. It became more difficult for terrorists to acquire explosives and to acquire or acquire firearms and that sort of thing. So it really did uh, necessitate an alternative means of attack. It requires little skill. You know, uh, if you look at the attacks, the orchestrated attacks uh, with small fire teams like the, the Mumbai attack, that was a, uh, a, it took a lot of planning, it took a lot of organization, it took a lot of uh, training for those that were going to carry out the attacks. And that, frankly, is not the case today. We see so much more of this type of thing because it requires, again, just little skill. It really just requires the ability for you to be able to drive a vehicle and have the intent to do damage. And then finally, our vehicles that we drive, it's not particularly suspicious to see a vehicle. It's not particularly suspicious to uh, your normal everyday citizen, and it's not particularly suspicious to us those that are charged with protecting others. In 2010, anybody ever heard of uh, Inspire Magazine? It's Al-Qaeda, right? Al-Qaeda's uh, uh, publication, professional, well done. Uh, it, is, uh, uh, it is their forum to uh, discuss topics like this with their followers worldwide. Well, in 2010, they did an article and inspired that really highlighted uh, vehicle attacks, the use of vehicles as a means to, uh, to accomplish their mission. And they publicized that. It was not so much of a guide on how to do it, but it certainly uh, laid, put the idea out there for their followers. Uh, in this article, we talked about, uh, it's called the ultimate mowing machine. It talked about, you know, perhaps adding blades or apparatus to the outside of the vehicle. The bigger the vehicle, the better uh, to accomplish uh, their objectives. In 2014, the Islamic State, the leadership, uh, urged vehicle ramming attacks. It urged uh, independent action on the part of their believers. Independent action that uh, was not orchestrated or not uh, planned so much, certainly didn't require a lot of training. It was very basic. Use a knife, use a gun. In this case, use your vehicle to create terror. And then in, in 2016, the Islamic State published a guide that was much more uh, detailed and uh, was a uh, roadmap for would-be attackers on how to execute this type of attack. So, <clears throat> that's the problem. That's the issue. That's what we have to worry about. And we should worry about it. 
like I said earlier, it's something that we get paid to do, and it needs to be our passion because, folks, if we don't do it, who's going to do it? It is our duty, it is our responsibility to worry about these things. And not only to worry about them, but to deal with the crisis and the consequence. I, as a law enforcement officer, I primarily deal with the crisis. I deal with, first of all, how do we harden our, uh, our venues to prevent the crisis? And then if the crisis does occur, how can I situate uh, the venue, either through personnel and resources or uh, any type of logistics so that we can better deal with it when it does occur. So that's what I want to talk about. I hope that you walk out of here after this uh, with, a, with just my thoughts on how you can better prioritize your efforts. Because think about it. If you go back to that video, I'm not going to do it. I was going to, but it's just too difficult. Go back and look at that video, that reconstruction of the Nice attack. That truck, uh, when it started the attack, it went. There was a physical object in the roadway that was preventing, you know, the flow of traffic in that direction. But you know what? Just you know, a terrorist is going to jump a curb, which is what happened here. He jumped a curb and went around the obstruction and inflicted mass damage on the crowd. So we have to prioritize where are we going to put our resources, our time and our logistics, and our money on protecting our, our critical infrastructure. Number one, I want to talk about the density of the crowd that you anticipate. Is that crowd confined to a particular area? And we're going to talk about each one of these in detail. I want you to look for areas of high-speed approach. And then I want you to look for areas that have unfettered access for large vehicles, commercial vehicles. Let's talk about it. So high pedestrian density areas. And these are areas that uh, I'm sure when you think about your venue and what, where you work and the area that you're charged with protecting, you can think of areas that are naturally high density areas. For me, uh, with AT&T Stadium and the ballpark and our uh, downtown area where we have lots of uh, activities that go on every weekend during the summer, I worry about things like queue lines, outdoor queue lines that are unprotected. Uh, we have in the uh, lower right corner, that's our Levitt Pavilion. That's an outdoor concert area that occurs uh, right there on Abram Street in Arlington. It's a major thoroughfare through our downtown area. We shut the roadway down, and uh, a lot of those people are standing in the roadway uh, as they watch this concert. And uh, protests, we get a lot of those, and you know, protests often are difficult to control, and a lot of there's a lot of people that are clustered in one area, and sometimes, and a lot of times, they are in the roadway, just with marches, and also our outdoor markets. In Arlington, you know, we have an outdoor market that we have every every Christmas over at the ballpark, and that is in the market is in a roadway. So, those are the things that uh, when I think about where do I want to focus my attention and, and my resources, uh, I look for areas that have high pedestrian density. <coughs> Now, crowd confinement. So if you look for areas that have, uh, where you have a crowd, first of all, most likely a dense crowd, and then you have crowds that are unable to run or to flee or to move uh, if attack does occur. At, uh, at the stadiums, I worry about our natural funnels. Uh, it's the, you know, we have, when you have 80 to 100,000 people that are coming to and leaving a venue, you're going to have large clusters of pedestrians throughout, but then there are certain areas where you have large clusters of pedestrians that are also in a confined space. So when you have our queue lines on each each end of the stadium, right prior to uh, to kickoff, you have thousands and thousands of people in close proximity that are in a in a enclave where they are approaching a gate. And there's really nowhere to, for them to go if something does happen. Same way with uh, uh, ingress and egress routes. So when you talk about so many people coming and going, uh, at, based on the pedestrian movement, the crowd dynamics, and the event itself, those areas of uh, confinement will shift. So the ingress areas of confinement, the queue lines trying to get in, will be different at the end of the night where we have uh, pedestrians that are confined by our own, uh, you know, perhaps our own roadway apparatus that we use to control traffic, they're confined, 
and they're waiting at an intersection and they're unable to leave. If something had happened at that point, we ha I have to consider, if something happened at that point, they are essentially blocked in, mass of people blocked in by our own apparatus. So how do we, you know, I, I definitely that comes into the calculus when I consider where do I want to put my resources, where do I want to put my personnel to better protect that area. Uh, High-speed avenues of approach. And, and I got this uh, definition directly from the Secret Service uh, during a presentation that they gave last year. Uh, and during that presentation, they were talking about, uh, I'm sorry, it was earlier this year. They were talking about how they had protected the inauguration route and uh, how they had changed from previous years. And we'll talk more about that later on. But really, uh, you know, high-speed avenue of approach is any area that will allow a vehicle to amass the speed and the energy to be able to inflict maximum harm and damage. Um, and when you look at this, I, I put this photo up here of at and Stadium because when you look at that, uh, you look at that, the roadways that surround the stadium, at least three of them, and I would argue all of them, are areas where vehicles can amass a high amount of speed uh, at any point during the venue if we don't take measures to prevent that from happening. Um, the same can be said for our downtown area in Arlington. I have concerns because Avon Street, like I said, is a major arterial roadway. And uh, you know, vehicles can amass a lot of speed, and because uh, frankly, it's, it's, a, it's a large road, and it's a long road, uh, just like these right here are. So when you think about your venues, I want you to think about those areas that approach your venue, that approach pedestrian areas that are adjacent to high-speed areas of approach. And then finally, I want, I want you to think about areas that you have that are uh, unrestricted or where commercial motor vehicles can easily access. Typically, it's gonna be those areas that have the high-speed approach zones, uh, large roadways where commercial vehicles can easily move. And that is exactly what we have at the Cowboy State or at and Stadium and at the ballpark is with uh, major roadways that allow commercial vehicles if we, don't, if we do not check them to approach our, our really our hardened protected zone. So, I just want to make sure we go back over those one more time. All of these are important, but I, when I look to where I really want to focus my resources, I look for areas that exhibit every one of these characteristics. Because like I said, the idea that we were going to fortify every every square foot of our venues is, is not going to happen. It's not feasible. So we have to prioritize where are we going to focus the most personnel, the most resources, the most money to protect it. And I, it, it's my assertion that these areas that meet this criteria are the ones that we need to do that. So how do we do that? Well, <clears throat> this is, I, I, I really want to highlight this because it's changed. This is not how we used to do things, particularly for our smaller venues. I mean, and for this example, I want to talk about our, in Arlington, our downtown area. I mentioned the Levitt Pavilion when we have concerts on the weekends. We have other things. We have celebrations that occur around the 4th of July, which is coming up. And in the past, we haven't done some of these things. So created an outer perimeter. So the outer perimeter is really, it's a buffer zone. Uh, you have your protected area, and then you have a perimeter around the protected area. It's not so much a hardened perimeter as it is it's created with signage. It's created with public safety personnel that are in uniform that are out on that outer perimeter because that is important. Public safety personnel in uniform are a tremendous deterrent for any type of attack, including a vehicle attack. Uh, I, I think that's a, a strong takeaway that I've had throughout my entire experience with this line of work that public safety personnel, just the visible presence of them in uniform are a tremendous deterrent for any type of, of an attack. And then that outer perimeter, you should restrict, you should prohibit commercial large vehicles from coming into your outer perimeter in order to give yourself a buffer zone between the large vehicles and your hardened inner perimeter, which we'll talk about in just a minute. This is really for our large venues that we have in Arlington. This is our managed traffic area. It's vast. Uh, it spreads out way away from the stadiums. Uh, and as we get closer to our 
marquee events or football games or large, large concerts or baseball games, we start to restrict the flow of these large vehicles as they get closer and closer to, to the initiation of the event. You can't do it for long. Uh, I can tell you that for our 4th of July parade that we have coming up uh, this year, we're going to restrict vehicles of this type uh, for about an hour prior to the event until the end of the day. So we do that because, again, I want that buffer zone. I want that buffer zone where we, if a commercial vehicle comes into the outer perimeter, we're going to notice it because we've got personnel, we've got signage, and we've got apparatus that are on this outer perimeter. And if something breaches that, it gives us a little bit more response time. Or if we didn't have an outer perimeter, commercial vehicles, large vehicles, can just roll right up to our hardened perimeter and then we, you know, it doesn't give us the response time that this outer perimeter does. So it's super important if you don't, if you have a large scale event or even if you don't have a large scale event, if you have a uh, area around your facility that you can restrict large vehicle access, I encourage you to do it. It gives you that extra uh, time to react in the case of an attack. It also gives you the ability to have a buffer zone between your victims and your, or your pedestrians and any type of attack vehicle. This is an example uh, of just what we've got here in Arlington. And this is our, if you look at the uh, slide on the left, that is our uh, 4th of July parade route. Uh, it's fortified, it's a hardened perimeter. That would be, in this case, would be considered our inner perimeter. And then the uh, on the left, the, uh, the blue square around the perimeter, and on the right, it's just laid out on the map. We call that the no-fly zone. That is the area where we are going to restrict large vehicles from coming into that zone or approaching our inner perimeter uh, before the event and up through the event. Any questions on that particular? So the inner perimeter, it is a, it's really it's just what it says. This is where you, you harden your, your facility. This is where you uh, have personnel and logistics that make it very difficult for a vehicle to enter. And you prioritize, like I said, based on the criteria that we previously discussed, you look at those areas that are going to have the most density, where pedestrians are confined, where you can get high-speed avenues of approach and where commercial vehicles can't access. Those are the areas that you really want to focus your resources and your time as you're creating this inner perimeter. This inner perimeter should be multiple layers. Uh, so when I say multiple layers, and we'll talk more about it, Multiple layers would be if I have an area that I have identified through my criteria as having the greatest vulnerability, the greatest risk, that's where I'm going to stack the deepest layers of both personnel and physical uh, impediments for vehicles to go through. We'll talk more about it. But the, the hardened perimeter should be just that. Now, every venue we have is going to require, well, you have to get vehicles, there, there will be vehicles that have to come in and out of your hardened perimeter. It's just, it's the dynamic, it's the, it's the nature of the business, no, no matter what it is. So you have to create safe and controlled ways where a vehicle can enter your hardened perimeter and then, and then exit. And you do that through, uh, you know, swinging gates and there's, we'll talk more about it, but we use vehicles in combination with hardened barricades. We also use uh, chicane patterns. So chicane patterns are just the serpentine patterns that you, that you, I'm sure you all are aware of, that require vehicles to, one, slow down, require vehicles to have to go through a, a check process before they can enter them, and it, it really prevents vehicles from gaining speed as they access our most critical areas. So we, we use those, and those work, work well, because, like I said, it's the nature of the beast. You <coughs> will have to have vehicles that come into your hardened perimeter during any of uh, and I just I brought this back up because I just wanted to, to, to highlight. So in this in this uh, hard perimeter we have for our Fourth of July parade coming up, we use a combination of concrete. Uh, we use portable uh, vehicle barriers. Uh, we use vehicles themselves. We use dump trucks that have uh, sand full of, full of sand. Uh, we have buses. Um, so it's a combination of things that are laid out. And again, they are laid out in a prioritized way based upon the risk assessment that we talked about earlier. So this is the part where I am certainly not an expert. But these are the things that I that I I want to talk about because these are examples of things that I would consider permanent barricades. So you have permanent, and you have portable, you have fixed barricades, and you have active and you have passive uh, barricades. 
First one I listed on here are planters. Uh, when I'm talking about planters, I mean large, you know, 1,500 pound, 2,500 pound planters. They are fantastic. Any type of landscaping is fantastic. Uh, if for any of the law enforcement personnel in here that have ever worked on patrol, you can attest that a tree that's only eight inches in diameter is a tremendous, it can withstand a tremendous amount of force. Uh, I've seen wrecks and crashes where vehicles are wrecked into a small tree like that, and I've just been astonished that the, the tree doesn't move at all. It is, so they are fantastic uh, uh, permanent fixtures that serve as barricades for vehicles that would, that would be put on our hands. Uh, another good thing about planters and, and retaining walls and trees are that they are relatively inexpensive and they are, uh, you know, aesthetically pleasing, which I, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but I'll, I'll go ahead and touch on it now. You know, we have to strike that balance and we all struggle to because we all have people that we report to. I don't care what it looks like. I care about how effective it is. At protecting the patrons that come to these venues. But I have just one voice, a small voice. And I have people that are much more concerned about what does it look like? How will it affect the aesthetics of the venue? So we've got to strike that balance. And things, natural things like trees, uh, retaining walls with landscaping, and these planters are alternatives that are relatively cheap and aesthetically pleasing and also very, very uh, good uh, at, uh, at meeting our needs. Uh, buildings obviously are great are great things to utilize. If you have natural choke points where vehicles, where you have buildings on either side of the roadway, those are fantastic to use. Uh, I wanted to. Oh, I also want to talk real quickly about the planners. So when I was getting the debriefing on the Ohio State attack, you know, I didn't realize that. Uh, well, first of all, if you look at that attack, those pedestrians that were that were out there were, were really out there in between a couple of buildings and an enclave. Uh, so they were densely packed in that area because of a fire alarm that had just occurred inside one of their dorms. Uh, they were there uh, because that is their evacuation area. They were really surrounded by buildings, so they really did not, they were pretty confined as well. Uh, it, was, it was a pretty vulnerable area, but one of the things that really helped thwart that attack <coughs> was a planter. You know, when this, when this suspect uh, reared off the roadway and started to drive across into that courtyard, one of the first things he hit was a, a planter. Now he went on to to, uh, to do a weapons attack afterwards, but that planter, if it had not been there, according to the police chief for, for Ohio State, it could have been far worse. So just wanted to highlight that. I thought that was interesting. And then, of course, there's bollards. Uh, all bollards are not uh, created equal. If you've dealt with that, you know uh, a lot of bollards are aesthetically pleasing, but don't don't have the crash rating that any of us would, would consider a reliable resource. So, and, very, and bollards are expensive. Uh, you know, right now we are, we're dealing with that in, in Arlington as we start to uh, <coughs> fortify our infrastructure in downtown. Uh, shallow mount bollards are, are pretty good because they kind of mimic the roots of a tree. You know, shallow mount doesn't require a lot of deep structure, but they really spread out and fan out, and we found those to be, uh, you know, Pretty good alternative if you, if you have to go with bollards, which we do, uh, then it's, it's not a bad thing. I'm just throwing that out there. I'm, again, I'm no expert, but that's, that's what has been our experience. And then wedge barriers. Wedge barriers are, are, uh, are pictured in the center uh, at the bottom. Uh, these are uh, hydraulically controlled. You'll see these at major infrastructure. They have them at the AT&T Stadium. Uh, there's, there's a lot of venues at the airport. You'll, you'll see these type of barriers. They're fantastic at stopping vehicles. They give you the... Uh, the active uh, uh, possibility so that you can let vehicles come and go, but if they're up, it, uh, it, really a vehicle's not gonna get through there, and if you if you have uh, explosive case capability for those, it helps you thwart uh, a vehicle that tries to breach as the ramp is down, and uh, that's that's a pretty cool feature. It just, it basically will, just, if you hit a button, it will explode up into the up position as the vehicle's mm -hmm. passing over, uh, the idea being that it high centers the vehicle or incapacitates the vehicle by undercarriage features. So, pretty good. Uh, these net barriers, I want, I couldn't find a picture of one that I like, uh, but the net barriers are pretty neat. They have these at Lockheed Martin. Uh, I've seen them. Uh, they are they are pretty slick. They're much like the wedge barriers. They have the nets. If you if you breach the gate, uh, it gives you know they're down the roadway toward the facility. 
it throws up a net, and uh, you know, I've seen videos. It, it appears like these things are, are really capable of stopping uh, a, a big commercial vehicle going about 50 miles an hour. So that's the claim. I, you know, I'm no expert, but I, I find them to be fascinating. I have areas in, in our venues where I think these net barriers could be uh, could be beneficial. So just throw it out there. And then, of course, the bar barrier gates, because again, you have to have areas on your facilities that you're going to have to let vehicles come and go. Even when you have your hardened perimeter set up, you have to have a way to let these go, come and go. And these gates, there are gates that uh, I have seen that are crash rated for, again, a large vehicle, you know, 2,500, 3,000 pounds that can uh, withstand a 60 mile an hour hit. So I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a good example of some of the more permanent barricades that we can utilize the barrier. And then these are examples of the portable ones. I uh, I put these on here because we, we utilize most of these. Um, I, I put the concrete on there as a, uh, as a as a portable, but really it's, I mean it is. I'll give you an example. We're using those in, a, in one of our events during the 4th of July downtown in the summer, uh, but it is not a cheap endeavor and is not a, a, a quick endeavor. It requires the apparatus and the crew to place them, remove them, and then take them away after the event's over. So they are portable, they are very effective if they are the proper size, uh, and they are, um, but they are expensive and, and time consuming to place. And water barriers, uh, as you know, I'm looking around the room, I can tell that some people have had experiences with water barriers. Uh, they are effective for, well, they can be effective if properly placed and properly uh, uh, connected, uh, but they can only be effective one time. So subsequent ramming uh, after the initial attack uh, would probably would render them completely useless. So uh, we, we do use water barriers, we have to, because they are relatively cheap, and they are really easy to move uh, and uh, to, to remove after the event's over. I say really, they are relatively easy compared to other things. So water barriers are great, but I would not uh, stake everything on a stream of water barrier. And regardless of whether you're talking about concrete or water or some of the other barriers we're going to talk about here, it's all in how you utilize them and all in how you place them. So none of these apparatus are good if they are any good if they're just standalone when not connected. So you take concrete. You lay it out on the, on the roadway. It's only as good as how you place it. If you are, if they're not, you know, the roadway or the, uh, the barriers must be connected one to the other to fortify the strength. If you have water or concrete that's not connected one to the other, it's it's not worthless, but it's not nearly as effective as it could be. If you have a roadway that runs like this, or this is the area you're trying to protect, this is the this is the direction that you anticipate. The attack may come from. If you lay your your apparatus perpendicular to that, you've really diminished the effectiveness of your apparatus. You must lay it, uh, you know, lengthways, where you've got instead of just that that small layer of concrete or that that small layer of water barrier or whatever. Now you turn it sideways and you've got you know 12 feet of concrete barrier or 10 feet of a water barrier. It's so much more effective. And if there are multiple ones that are linked together in that, I call it the finger style pattern where you've got fingers of apparatus that are in the avenue of approach, so much more effective. So even water barriers can be effective if they're utilized in the right place. And again, how do you know the right place? You go through that threat assessment we talked about. And if it's not a high threat assessment, which you obviously you have to protect it, that's where I would use water. And that's where we do use water barriers. Uh, but they've got to be linked and they've got to be properly placed. And then vehicles, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over the tire undercarriage disabled barriers. And uh, on the bottom left there, that's that's an example. Uh, so is the, the top right where the van is high centered there. Those are, we have those on the top right. Those MDBs are, are good. We're getting these on the bottom here because these are, these are apparatus that you can, you know, a couple of people can deploy relatively easy. Uh, they're relatively easy to store. Any of these like those up there will store them in a box and you take them out and set them up. It's, it's, it's not something you can do in five minutes, but it's, it's effective. And they're effective because they will disable the vehicle 
but you're limited. How big is the vehicle? How fast is the vehicle going? So all of those things have to be considered, but they are effective because they are portable. And the portability combined with, uh, you know, you combine those with other apparatus, uh, it, it can be really, they really have a, a, an important place in, in protecting our infrastructure. And then there's there's another wedge barrier on the top left, and we're, we're acquiring those. I'm excited about those. Those, again, have to be used in combination with other type of physical barriers to prevent vehicles. But it, it gives you the ability to have a hydraulic gate that is that can allow vehicles to, to pass into your protected hardened zone, your inner perimeter, uh, but also can serve as a really good stopping power. Those are portable. In other words, that's a trailer. Pull the trailer out, you take the wheels off. It's, it's, a, it's a process, takes about 20 minutes, and it leaves you with that type of a gate. That when you put that, that is really what that is. It's a gate. You should combine that with other barrier types and it can be very effective. Okay, so this is just uh, some, this is part of the, uh, the Secret Service briefing that they gave after the inauguration that I thought was important and it was, it was a good takeaway. It's completely uh, uh, not sensitive information, so I'm just sharing it with everyone. Uh, this was how, this was an example. They use this as an example. This is an example of how their, their barricade patterns were set up uh, for the 2013 inauguration. If you see, you know, they've got buildings on the left and the right, <clears throat> and there are, they do use a vehicle here. They use a, a, a just a, a passenger vehicle, probably a police car, as a swinging gate for this particular intersection. Look at the barriers in the roadway. They are, they are perpendicular to the threat. Uh, they are not very deep. There's only really one layer of protection up there. <coughs> this is an example of the exact same intersection and how they would utilize, again, it's a point of ingress and egress because they have another gate here, but it is much more fortified for the 2017 operation. And it really highlights you know, how we've changed and how we all should look at changing the way we protect our events. In this one, if you look at the concrete barriers, that's what the blue ones are, that are utilized uh, on the sidewalks. Uh, they are linked together, and they are perpendicular, to, or I'm sorry, they are parallel to the threat. So they, uh, they provide much greater protection. If you look at how much deeper they are than this, than the previous model, they're much deeper, they're much more fortified. They use dump trucks filled with sand that are a formidable barricade. They're also movable, uh, but you have to have you know, drivers in those and they have to be vigilant. They talk more about that. And then they use one of those wedge barriers that are <laughs> controlled, and the wedge barrier is backed with, again, stacked concrete that is linked together. So much better. Here's another example of uh, the same type of thing. This was a, uh, again, it was an area where they were going to expect that they would have to have. Uh, portable and movable gate or and they used buses in 2013 buses are okay uh, because they do cover a large area they are relatively heavy but they're not as heavy as uh, other apparatus uh, and again if you look at the way that they laid out their uh, their barricades their concrete uh, it, it leaves a lot of room for uh, improvement for 2017 this is that same intersection if you can see, they, are, they still have the bus there. The bus, however, is backed up with dump trucks filled with sand. Uh, it's also uh, backed up with that uh, median in the middle. And it gives uh, a chicane, uh, essentially, for vehicles that would come and go from there. Uh, if you look at the concrete that's laid out on the sidewalks, uh, again, it's just deeper and thicker, and it's connected one to the other. And it's a much more formidable uh, barrier for any vehicle that would want to move. Try to do the curve. So, just to recap, I'm going to finish up, and then we'll talk. We'll talk more about it, and uh, you can ask questions or whatever. These are the things you need to do. This is, in my opinion, this is the threat assessment you need to make. You need to look for those areas that have the most uh, dense pedestrian traffic, uh, and in those areas that have the highest pedestrian density, look for the ones that are where they are naturally confined and they're unable to move, they're unable to flee during an attack. If you combine those two with areas that are, that would allow a vehicle to have, to amass the speed and the force necessary to inflict maximum damage, and then of course vehicle access that is for large commercial vehicles, those are the areas that 
greatest threat your credit risk. That's where you want to put your greatest amount of money and resources. Then you want to establish this buffer zone. Again, you want to manage the traffic. You want to restrict commercial vehicles. And I say manage traffic, that includes your pedestrians. You want to take your pedestrians to areas that will allow them access to the venue, but will also keep them from entering a confinement zone. Uh, keep them from being too bulked up together as you do your light timing and you do your uh, pedestrian crossing areas. And again, you want to uh, uh, have that inner perimeter, which is a combination of all the different things. Not only just scratch the surface, if you've done any research on the number on the types and the, the uh, models of barricades that are out there, it's endless. Uh, and one thing I forgot to mention about barricades is they don't all have to be physically. Uh, dominating. In other words, you can get a lot of benefit from just having signage on your hard perimeter. Just having, again, uniformed public safety personnel. There are going to be cops. But uniformed public safety personnel, marked public safety apparatus on your hard perimeter, while it may not be a physical deterrent, is certainly a visible deterrent. And it is very effective. So, I, I don't, I, I Neglected to mention that, and that is a powerful, powerful tool that we have at our disposal that is already on our payroll. And then finally, vigilance, and this is just the final word for me, is vigilance is, is, is something that I, I, people that I work with have gotten tired of me talking about and uh, saying after, before every briefing that we go out on our operations. We have to be vigilant. Whether it be our personnel that are out there on the line, that are actually manning these positions, manning these swinging gates, out on our outer perimeter, restricting commercial vehicles, they all have to be vigilant. Our commanders have to be vigilant. And us, our planners, the ones that are the professional warriors, we have to be vigilant and continue to stay abreast as what are the emerging threats, what are the emerging, the emerging uh, better defense systems, we have to be vigilant about pushing our uh, budget keepers to make the expenditures, fortify our venues, to protect our personnel. Uh, so I would say vigilance throughout is really the secret because you can put these apparatus out, you can, you can do everything right, but if you don't have vigilant personnel that are on your, on your uh, operation, you're, you're very vulnerable. I'm not going to say it's not for, it's for nothing, but it's, you're, you're not nearly as strong as if you had vigilant personnel. See, we have to push ourselves to be vigilant and push our personnel to be vigilant. That is really going to be the secret.